So we are so excited to be back for another week of what I've been finding to be a tremendous amount of fun, some great conversation. We're back here on Women's Health Weekly, live from New York City, from the women's health experts at Maiden Lane Medical. I am sure everybody will learn a lot, be able to engage with us by asking questions on the YouTube channel, which of course I'm going to ask you about a dozen times to subscribe to, um, so you could have access to our future content and get information about all of our shows and see our clips and interact with our experts and even be able to contact our experts in the future. Last week we had a great 40-minute conversation with Dr. Jamie Glick, who's an expert dermatologist here in New York City. Next week, we have on the show Dr. Stephanie Blank, who's the Director of Gynecologic Oncology at the Mount Sinai Medical Center, and she is going to talk to us about everything cervical health, pap smears, HPV, cervical cancer prevention, treatment, you name it. She is one of the world's premier experts in this area, but this week... Here we have, in spite of this gloomy day, we have, we have our awesome guest, Carlin Rosenblum, who is a registered dietitian and expert clinical nutritionist. She graduated from NYU with a master's degree in clinical nutrition. We are so excited to have her here uh, this week. Just a couple, I say hi, Carlin, hi to everybody. Hi, guys. Please. Thanks welcome, for having me. Welcome, welcome <laughs> to our show. I want to add just a couple of things before we get started that I always add into the beginning of the show. The first item is that while we may have a conversation at some point during the show about certain products that we recommend, uh, certain techniques that we recommend, we at Maiden Lane Medical, and just also disclaimer, Carlin does work for Maiden Lane Medical. We at Maiden Lane Medical have absolutely no financial interest. We don't gain any money from mentioning these products. Sometimes we even talk badly about them. And we're happy to do that because we really want our viewers to get expert information about health and wellness and nutrition and everything women's health. We want you to get that from us instead of going somewhere else. The second and last thing I will tell you before we really get started is that we're really psyched to be able to launch our podcast. So we're basically just taking the audio of these conversations and turning them into a podcast. Uh, we just put up our first one today. We expect it to be broadcast by Monday or Tuesday because it takes a couple of days, apparently, for Apple and Spotify to pick it up. Um, so we're really pumped to have that out there so you can check out the Women's Health Weekly uh, podcast. We'll put up links on our Maiden Lane Medical website and make sure all our Viewers and friends have that information on uh, Facebook and YouTube and Instagram as well. All right, so, Carla, this is awesome. You're an expert nutritionist. Um, you, I have personally utilized your expert services, your advice, and I have gained for myself, through you, a much better understanding of how to live well from a nutrition standpoint. Um, so I want to just, just, let's nail the basics down. Just what, yeah. does a, what does a nutritionist do? What do you do for a living? Tell, tell us. Um, so, you know, in my job as a nutritionist at Maiden Lane, what I do is I really help people to develop a healthier relationship with food, um, you know, find what will, you know, work for them in order to, you know, maybe manage everything from weight to some type of clinical condition, like, diabetes, you know, heart conditions, uh, hormonal balance, um, to really just optimizing their health and wellness. So, you know, when I'm working with somebody, I really try to, you know, first figure out what their health and nutrition goals are, and then how we can figure out a plan of action that fits, you know, within their, their current lifestyle to really help promote the best health possible so all right now you you've got you've gone to school i mean this is not you didn't just you didn't just read a google blog uh that somebody wrote you you went to serious school graduate school you went to nyu which is no joke of a place to go to school which is a fantastic institution and you learned the background science so how does that mm -hmm. differentiate you from somebody who's giving some sort of what i like to call not the best advice how does that differentiate you and why should someone 
come to see an expert clinical nutritionist? Yeah, that's a great question. So I spent four years um, doing my master's in clinical nutrition and also uh, doing my registered dietitian certification training. So the difference between a registered dietitian and just a health coach is that we have, uh, first of all, the, you know, scientific training. You know, I had to take classes from organic chemistry to oh, organic chemistry. Bio. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not my favorite, not going to lie, but, um, you know, really <laughs> having that, you know, basic level of knowledge is so important when we're talking about nutrition. Um, and really, you know, the difference between a dietitian and a health coach is that I can work in a clinical setting such as a, a practice or a hospital and really treat conditions and people through nutrition. Um, so, you know, there is strong medical nutrition therapy protocols um, that have, you know, research to support their efficacy to help the management of specific diseases. So it goes beyond just, you know, telling people to and limit their sugar, right? There are specific diets that help to control um, certain diseases, such as, again, you know, diabetes is a big one. Kidney failure, another big one where, again, you have to know how specific micronutrients really play a role in the progression of the disease. Um, so really taking the, the time to go to school, get the master's, do the year-long internship, trains you to be able to handle these types of scenarios and clients um, and patients that are, you know, that need more support than just behavior change. So, yeah, it's clear from our standpoint as uh, physicians and people who are directly contacting patients every day that uh, that advice, that level of advice needs to come on, come from somebody with a certain level of expertise. And I would certainly tell all our YouTube listeners and our friends on Facebook who are listening to this that you should be careful about who you're getting your medical advice, your nutrition advice about, because some things that they may be advising you about can adversely affect you if they don't understand the underlying science. Definitely. And I would say that's something that, especially with social media, has become very difficult to control because we have a lot of health influencers on Instagram with really no credentials to be recommending certain diets or lifestyles or products to people. Um, and yet they're the ones that a lot of the time are disseminating this information. So I definitely try to educate people on resources um, that are reliable. And the fact that a registered dietitian is a really get, great resource if you are deciding to embark on a new health journey or you have a condition that you feel can be improved through diet and lifestyle and you want that extra support. So we, we, we'd like to be the health influencers for our patients and uh, our YouTube uh, listeners. So let's just talk about some, some, some interesting items that, uh, and you mentioned a couple of disease conditions. You mentioned diabetes and renal failure. I'm hoping because our, and just so you know, the, the general age of the people that are listening to our show, they're usually um, six, two thirds of the people that, that subscribe to us on uh, YouTube and who view our show are, they're under 44 years of age. So I'm hoping there's not a lot of renal failure in those <laughs> patients. Um, if there is, so uh, we have some doctors for you. Um, but uh, most of those patients are gonna have the things that we like to tie back to common women's health conditions, including obesity, um, and going along sometimes with obesity is polycystic ovary syndrome or what a lot of our patients are coming in and they'll say that's a hormone imbalance and in fact it is a hormone imbalance. Um, and endometriosis are some topics that we really want to weave into the conversation about uh, nutrition and about, uh, and about diet and dietary supplements. So let's talk about, I, one of the first things I wanted to talk about today was all the, just let's get it out there. Let's put it out there about all these diets. 
There's a ton of diets out there, and if you just Google diet or top diets or most common diets, you're going to get all sorts of crazy information. So let's just debate. Why do people even go on diets? What's the, what's the, why bother? Yeah, that's a great question. Diets and bad diets in particular, I think, are really appealing because they promise a quick fix that really almost preys on you know our vanity in a sense, right? You go on a diet for two weeks and it promises that you can lose 10 pounds and it's something that we feel we can we can do for a short period of time, get the results that we want without really having to fully commit to any type of lifestyle and behavior change. So that's the that seems to be to me that would be the major difficulty in because um, it sounds like in principle we're going to talk about some of these diets momentarily but it sounds like in principle just from a scientific standpoint some of the diets are okay but but based on what you're saying to me it sounds like some of them don't come with the support that one would need to create real behavioral and lifestyle change that would lend itself to the long-term health that needs to be maintained in order to, or the long-term thinking that needs to be maintained in order to um, comply with some of these dietary regimens, which aren't always easy to comply with even, even at the beginning. Yeah, I think that's completely right. I think that, you know, a lot of times these diets don't necessarily have our health in the best interest and people don't necessarily care about their health, they just care more about getting the results. And I think working with a dietitian, we really promote lifestyle and behavior change. And unless you're really motivated and really ready from a psychological perspective to, to make those changes in, in your life, to your diet and your lifestyle, it can be, you know, difficult and something that people don't necessarily want to do, right? So, so. so I, I, that sounds like me because I'm, everyone's motivated. And this is really about, this is, you know what, this whole conversation's for me. I, I had you on so I could have more counseling about my diet, but uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, the, so everyone's motivated um, until it's like 10 o'clock at night and you're totally bored and not really tired and ready to go to sleep. And there's a pint of Ben and Jerry's in the freezer. And that's the motivation goes out the window for me at that point. All right, so let's talk about some of these some of these um, specific regimens. Let's talk about uh, one that's very common. We hear it all the time. It's a really easy word. Let's talk about keto. What does that even mean? What's keto diet? What's the keto diet? Yeah, great question. So the keto diet is a extremely high fat, extremely low carb, and kind of lowish protein diet. So typically about 75% of your calories per day are coming from fat. 5% of your calories are, you know, coming from carbs and the rest from protein. So the keto diet was originally designed for epileptic, epileptic patients. And, you know, right now in the past two years or so, it's, you know, recently been utilized as a weight loss diet. So it's become very popular because when you are eating such a high fat diet, your sorry, a high fat diet, very low carb diet, um, our body starts to break down fat to be utilized for energy because there's not enough carbohydrates to be used as our main energy source. So when that happens, we see a breakdown of fat. We also see a loss of water weight because carbohydrates are stored in the body with water. So the combination of the two has created, you know, this very rapid weight loss that a lot of people see. So the ketogenic diet is definitely one where it's become a fad diet over the past year or two, just simply because you see results pretty quickly. Um, my The main thing I see with the ketogenic diet with my patients, one, if you're not 
doing a really good job about portioning out the fat and the carbs and the protein to be pretty precise, you're not necessarily going to get the best results. And people typically will see a plateau. The other thing is that the ketogenic diet in itself, because it's so high fat, can tend to promote the consumption of, you know, a lot of saturated fats or animal fats that in the past, you know, the research has really shown aren't great for our health. So I think there is a, a good way that you can do the ketogenic diet if you are incorporating more plant-based fats, um, non turkey vegetables, and animal and plant-based proteins. Um, but it's really, really hard and it's really restrictive. And in my opinion, I think if you can accomplish weight loss on a less restrictive diet, then that should be our first approach. You know, some people do really just need that kind of instant gratification in order to motivate them to make behavior change. So I do think it can be a helpful tool to jumpstart a diet and then you know, from there, start to work more on developing more sustainable eating habits. Because at the end of the day, you know, it might work for a period of time, but are you really going to want to eat that way for the rest of your life? Yeah. So, so that's interesting. And I, I'm going to ask you about a couple more diets. Um, and then I want to kind of wrap up this conversation about diets with um, conversation about whether any of these harm any particular disease condition or whether any of these actually help. Uh, mm -hmm. any particular disease condition. So let's get the let's get the overview on so it sounds it sounds to me like keto and what I know as a lay like you know like a self-taught nutritionist um, how it sounds like the Atkins diet is very similar. Is that this what's the difference between the two and why would somebody you know other than great marketing why would somebody choose mm -hmm. one over the other? Yeah, so the Atkins diet is similar to keto in the sense that it's a lower carb diet. But keto is an extremely low carb diet. So, so it's a little more restrictive than Atkins. Is that the is that where exactly. we're going with that? So okay. On the Atkins diet, you can have some carbohydrates, um, mainly high fiber carbohydrates, right? So like legumes or some fruit, um, and they restrict the carbohydrates, but it's not as low as five percent of your of your calories. Um, so it's a little less restrictive than, you know, what a ketogenic diet is. Um, typically, I would say, you know, again, all of these diets um, can have benefits for certain people, but it really depends on, you know, first of all, you as an individual, how sustainable this is. Second of all, you know, do you have any, like you said, disease conditions that we need to be aware of that could be negatively impacted? So we love, we, we love the, the YouTube questions. Uh, we mm -hmm. can't wait for to see some more YouTube questions. Fantastic. Um, so, so the, the whole 30 diet, uh, yeah. I was on the Whole30 diet. I, I enjoyed it. I en actually enjoyed it. I, I was comfortable with it. I'm not a big drinker anyway, so cutting out alcohol mm -hmm. was sort of a non-issue. Um, and I, I felt pretty good. My, my, what, my, what my eight-year-old daughter now uses as a, uh, as a drum, um, my, otherwise, mm -hmm. otherwise known as my stomach went down, and things were pretty good <laughs> on the Whole30 diet, but I kind of bounced, bounced back off of that when uh, COVID-19 quarantining was a thing, and it still is, obviously. Um, but, uh, so whole 30, what's the story there? So whole 30, you know, their whole concept is eating whole real foods. Um, and you know, not even creating whole 30 ingredient approved, you know, cookies or breads or things like that. I think whole 30 is a very valuable jumpstart diet because it's, it's, designed to be temporary, right? So it's designed to be 30 days and that's it. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it can be a really good way for them to jumpstart a new type of um, behavior and recognize that, okay, I really don't need 
this much sugar in my diet. I really don't need, you know, all of the alcohol that I normally drink. So it can really help people to kind of just become more aware of their eating habits during that 30 day period. And then again, from there, as you're transitioning off, you know, figure out what habits you can adopt into your regular lifestyle and what habits you might want to slowly reincorporate. That, that's great. So I have two more for you. Um, okay. I know there are like a zillion out there, but I want to kind of hit the more popular ones. Um, yeah. So we, we, we just talked about Whole30. Um, and so is, is paleo just a more extreme version of Whole30? So I actually think it's kind of the opposite. Okay. Whole30 is, is more of an extreme version of a paleo diet. So the paleo diet, typically you're restricted to foods that were, you know, around during the paleolithic era. Um, so, like dinosaur, you know, like dinosaur meat. Exactly. Okay. Uh, you know, like T Rex. <laughs> um, but, you know, with the paleo diet, you can have paleo cookies or paleo crackers or waffles or things made from approved paleo ingredients that are not allowed on the whole 30 diet. You know, with all of these restrictive diets where you're cutting out foods, um, you just want to be careful, you know, that we don't have any micronutrient deficiencies or anything like that. Because with a lot of these, you're still cutting out, you know, quote unquote, um, bad foods or foods that are less healthy for us, like added sugar and, you know, processed fats. But with a lot of them, you're also cutting out healthy foods like legumes is a big one. Whole grains um, is another one. So you just want to be, you know, careful if you are adopting this lifestyle. Um, you know, definitely, again, I always recommend to do it under the advisement of a dietitian that can make sure you're getting all of your nutrient needs. Great. Great. All right. So I have one more for you. And I, I, I think this one's going to be neat. Weight Watchers. I know a lot Wait, of people have, Weight Watchers has been around forever. Uh, yeah. been around for what, more than at least 40 years, if not 50 years or longer. Um, it seems to be offering people some modicum of success. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? So I think Weight Watchers, apparently they recently kind of changed their structure and their point system. Um, so certain foods are now zero points. Um, and I believe some of those foods are things like fruits and like grilled chicken, which in my opinion, you know, you can still gain weight or not see weight loss from eating quote unquote healthy foods if they're not in the right portions. Sure. So, you know, yeah. things like fruit in particular breaks down into sugar in the body. If we're eating too much fruit, that could definitely be a factor in, you know, our success with weight so, so loss. So those are zero points and I, I'm minimally familiar with the points. And so basically if I eat a whole chicken for breakfast and a whole chicken for dinner and like intersperse like a can an entire cantaloupe and a watermelon or like a cantaloupe and a honeydew, then that's no points and I'm good for the day, but I'm definitely getting fat from that regimen. Right, exactly. Okay. So <laughs> gotcha. in my opinion, I think, yeah, I think if you're doing it the way it was intended, which is probably not to go overboard with anything, then I think it can be effective. Uh, I also think the, the level of support that a program like Weight Watchers provides is really beneficial for people. A lot of what I see is really the importance of accountability throughout this process because, you know, if I can tell you what to do to help you lose weight, but, you know, if we're not checking in on a regular basis, if we're not, you know, meeting every two or three weeks and you lack that level of accountability, it's a lot easier to fall off track. So th that's great. And I think that's a great, that's a really fantastic overview of all the diets. We're getting some great questions from both YouTube and uh, our YouTube audience and our Facebook audience. Um, I want to, before we get to some of those questions, which we'll certainly get to and certainly tie back some of this information to um, actual diseases and things that are commonly affecting women, uh, just a quick break to remind everybody you're here on Women's Health Weekly, uh, live every Friday at noon. Uh, this week, our guest, uh, Carlin Rosenblum, who is a clinical nutritionist and registered dietitian, reporting uh, 
on everything we need to know about nutrition to keep ourselves healthy. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, so we can keep expert information coming to you all the time. All right, so let's talk about what I'm going to call, I like to term crazy eating. Uh, because when I, when I get into my, this is what I call it for myself, when I get into these sort of um, eating ruts, as my wife likes to call them, um, I just can, the only term I can really come up with, there's probably a more clinical term um, that is associated with just um, some of the psychology that goes along with, with poor eating habits. Um, so what I, you, you told me earlier you wanted to just touch on today um, something that all of us are probably experiencing, which is um, being homebound and in association with the coronavirus pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, there are, I'm sure, so I see people going one of two ways. They're either succeeding nutritionally or they're going off the cliff like me and uh, they want, they need, we need to know. So, how, so let's talk about some, some healthy eating habits that we can develop while we're working from home. Definitely. So I think the biggest thing that people are struggling with is really just the lack of boundaries and the lack of having a set schedule that they're used to. So one of the biggest things I've been recommending to my patients is to set a daily schedule that includes breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a snack if you're used to eating one, um, and really set strict guidelines around when you're, you know, allowed to eat during the day so that you're not just, you know, grazing because you happen to be working in the kitchen and you maybe have a lull between meetings. Um, but we really want to try to focus on, you know, eating when we're hungry, and being more mindful of our hunger levels and, and non-hunger related eating, right? Um, I think that's definitely the biggest issue that a lot of people are struggling right now with. So, you know, coming up with a schedule based on your eating patterns um, and really creating that structure can be very helpful. So non-hunger related eating. Is that, mm -hmm. is that the segue into stress, the conversation about stress eating? Yes, definitely. So, yeah, talk, talk to me about stress eating because you've been working with us for what, almost two years now? Is that yeah. that long? And you may have seen me stressed or not stressed and fat and less fat. Um, and so I know, I understand stress eating for myself, but please share, please share with us what, I, what, what, what we even mean by that. Sure. So, you know, People eat for a variety of reasons beyond hunger and nutrition, right? Definitely emotions play into that. And I think for a lot of people, food is a, a way to cope with whatever emotion we're feeling in that moment. And it's a lot easier to turn to food than it is to really sit with whatever we're going through. So one thing that I really try to do with my patients is to first help them to recognize when this emotional eating is happening. Is it a certain time of day? Is there a specific trigger event that's creating this? Um, and then really try to identify, okay, what is the emotion behind it? Is it stress? Is it boredom? Is it anger? Um, is it, you know, happiness, joy? Um, and try to, once we figure out what that emotion is, try to come up with some non-food coping mechanisms that we can use to, you know, either bring us joy or, you know, make us feel better and really get at the root of what we need to help cope with that emotion. Because most of the time, food is not gonna actually make us feel better. It's not gonna make us feel less stressed or, you know, less anxious or happier. Um, and I think really learning to find some positive ways that we can cope with our stress or cope with whatever emotion that we're feeling um, and save food for, you know, when we're actually hungry is the best way to help us reduce that type of Behavior. So that's interesting. So it's clearly a psychological component to overeating, to incorrect eating, eating at incorrect times. Um, so while we've talked about that, I'll pop in the fact that on the 19th 
of June, we're going to have Dr. Daniel Hoffman come join us. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about addictions. What are we addicted to? Is it food? Is it bad relationships? Uh, we're going to have a nice conversation about addictions. Maybe we'll throw in some drugs and alcohol there to, to make it more fun. But the, uh, the conversation about addiction sort of comes to mind when we're talking about food. And I know that there's at least one app out there. Uh, mm -hmm. that sort of helps people to maybe skirt the needing to see an, a, a regular psychiatrist, and it's called Noom. Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard of this? Have you heard of this app? And if, what's your patient's experience? Yeah, I've heard of Noom. It's, I think, a weight loss support app, um, and they have people that give you little tips on how to improve your diet based on what you're inputting um, into the app. I have had some clients that have used that um, before, and they said it was helpful. Um, but I think with the app, they felt like they kind of hit a wall at a certain point. But I think it's helpful if you need that that constant little extra push or extra reminder to do something. It can be really helpful. I imagine there's a combination of things that. And again, back to the need to see an expert clinical nutritionist, it's probably a combination of things that can be tailored to an individual. Some individuals need the app and X diet. Some need, individuals need a real person and not the right, and a different diet and different conversation about. So it's really a conversation that's ta tailored to everybody's disease state, goals, lifestyle, and not just something that you could Google. It's uh, and you and, I, you and I have heard that patient that that comment from why well, she just told me what I Google, what I could Google. I'm like, no, no, that's not how it works. That person sat with you and discovered everything there is to know about you as much as you would tell her. And, and it's not Google the, you know, the, the advice based on that information is not Googleable. Uh, is that a word? Googleable? Is that like a new modern? We're going to see that in Merriam Webster next year. Not Google, Googleable. Anyway, so um, I want to just transition into having a conversation about some of the disease states that are commonly associated uh, in women's health. And, uh, Meg, and the great segue to that is uh, Megan has asked, and Megan, one of our YouTube viewers, has asked us a question. Um, and she really wants to hear your opinion on hormone regulation. And part of this, I think, goes back to the conversation uh, that, we can, that we've got, we can have about polycystic ovary syndrome, which, you know, just mm -hmm. for, without getting into the details about polycystic ovary syndrome is really, in the end, um, a a metabolic syndrome, a matter of dysregulation of um, insulin, a matter of dysregulation or imbalance of gonadotropins or hormones that are created by um, the ovaries. Uh, so there are um, a number of issues that go along with that. And Megan's question is, what if you're, what if you do have such hormone re regulation issues um, and your periods aren't regular? Um, is there a recommendation from a dietary standpoint to start working on that without, maybe even without seeing a doctor? Definitely. So with my hormonal imbalance patients, my PCOS patients in particular, we really try to focus on a low glycemic diet that is extremely high in fiber and antioxidants. When we're talking about hormonal health, we're really talking about our health on a, you know, a cellular level. So making sure that we are helping our body to eliminate any type of excess hormones or toxins that are creating stress and creating more hormonal imbalance. Um, definitely with PCOS, because it's so closely related to insulin, trying to promote a diet that um, again, is low glycemic or not going to, you know, raise our, our blood sugar and promote that insulin response is extremely important. Um, you know, the, the types of foods that we're incorporating are definitely going to be mostly plant based. So lots of non starchy vegetables, you know, leafy greens, um, lots of um, vegetables in the brassica family like cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and broccoli. Um, the anti-inflammatory omega-3s are another important nutrient to promote. So um, more fish like salmon, um, hemp seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, all of that, you know, good healthy fat that our body needs to help promote um, hormone production. Um, 
and then really cutting down on things that we know are going to contribute to hormonal imbalance. So the big things I typically see with PCOS, dairy, gluten is another one, and then definitely, um, you know, added sugar, excessive amounts of caffeine, and excessive amounts of alcohol. So, P so, so PCOS is also, um, and I, you, I know that you and I have had this conversation before in the office, is that PCOS is also a condition that lends itself to hyperlipidemia. In other words, elevated levels of um, fats occurring in your body. And mm -hmm. so you said, I remember you saying to me one time earlier that um, some of the diets that are associated with high fat intake, like the Atkins diet, for example, are really adversely, uh, are really bad uh, for people um, who may be experiencing obesity um, but the obesity is, is, is as a result of polycystic ovary syndrome. And that really, all that needs to be, see, that's why we need new clinical nutrition. All that needs to be put together by somebody who knows what they're talking about. Definitely. And I also think too, you know, a calorie is not a calorie, right? So fat coming from avocados is very different than fat coming from, you know, a hostess cupcake. So that's oh, also. Oh no, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really important. Information too, right? Um, and I think with some of these really high fat diets, again, if you're doing it well and you're incorporating, you know, more of the omega threes and the monounsaturated fats like, you know, avocado and olive oil and almonds and tahini, um, you know, it can be done in a healthy way. But if it's a lot of saturated fats from animal proteins or even processed fats like vegetable oils, it can definitely have a negative impact. Interesting. Okay. So we have another great question from one of our YouTube viewers, Sharon asked the question. So I, I think that a lot of, I hear, we hear from a lot of people that they've um, elim so eliminated certain um, foods from their diet and then they either feel better when they potentially add them back, uh, they feel worse. Is that always, I think the question that she's asking is, um, and that actually, when I think about it, it's a, it's a really legit sort of very insightful question. She's asking, is that, I think she's asking the question, is that always diagnostic of that particular food item being a problem or is it possible that that food item has then been eliminated for long enough that maybe um, the digestive enzymes that are associated specifically with that food have sort of down-regulated and now you're adding that food back without the proper digestive enzymes. Um, so that, she asks a, a question that, that actually is a lot more complicated than the question itself. And maybe the answer is not even, not even around. So yeah, these elimination diets can be, can be tricky because the outcome isn't necessarily a one-to-one, -one, like your body may never have had a problem with that food you eliminated it and maybe you kind of felt a little better and maybe that wasn't the only factor. You add it back, you feel worse, and then you come to a conclusion. Um, and a couple of episodes ago, we talked a lot about observation bias, but um, tell me what you think of that, Carlin. Yeah, so I think elimination diets are really, in my opinion, the best way to kind of figure out what's working or not working for your body. I think a lot of times when you're cutting things out, um, you're really allowing the body to heal, right? You're removing these inflammatory factors. So, you know, sometimes you can add these foods back and no problem, It's you notice that it's fine. Other times, if you do notice that it's a problem, in my opinion, it's kind of a sign that it was a problem for a while and maybe you were just, you know, used to living a certain way or a certain level of, you know, discomfort that, you know, you didn't really notice. Um, I think people, some people are so used to feeling bloated or uncomfortable after eating that it becomes almost normal, right? And then they yeah. cut out these foods. They're like, oh, wow, I, I never noticed how much it affected me. Right. Until I cut it yeah, amazing. Um, so I think, you know, there are some diagnostic tools that you can use, um, aside from an elimination diet, like IgG testing 
Is the research really there to support its efficacy? Not necessarily, but I think, you know, if it's something that you really want to explore without having to fully commit to doing an elimination diet, it can be a good first step. So here's a good, here's a good question from another YouTube viewer. And it's particularly timely because we're in the middle of this global pandemic and Gabor wants to know that it's, I think everyone has an understanding uh, in the public that a strong immune system is important to offer us protection from a whole variety or host of diseases. Um, the question is, what are the factors in our diet and what type of uh, dietary supplements, additives, techniques can we use to help shore up or boost the quality of our immune system? Great. So probably the most important thing, in my opinion, to supporting your immune system is having a healthy gut because there's a really, you know, strong correlation to the bacteria in our gut and our immune health. Um, so definitely eating a diet, again, that's high in um, antioxidants, high fiber foods to support the production of those short chain fatty acids in our gut that the bacterial bacteria are able to ferment um, and promote, you know, the proliferation of these healthy bacteria in our gut. Um, fermented food also great for our gut bacteria as well. Um, so that would be number one. Number two, I think definitely just again, promoting um, consumption of more whole grains, um, vegetables, less processed meats, less sugar, less things that are creating inflammation to the body. Um, and then from a supplement perspective, incorporating a little bit more of things that we know to support our immune health, such as, you know, vitamin C is a big one. Um, and then also another one would be vitamin D, surprisingly important for our Im immune system. Um, and a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D. Um, and then from a life lifestyle perspective, I would say making sure we're getting regular exercise. I've been telling all of my patients to try to do at least 20 to 30 minutes every day, um, just from, you know, a physical and mental health perspective. Right. Um, and then making sure you're getting proper right. food at night, which is anything between seven and a half to nine hours a night. So everyone knows we don't script these conversations. These are just, Carl, Carl is an expert. I can ask her questions and all of our guests are experts and they know the answers to all these questions. But Carl, you nailed the perfect segue into kind of wrapping things up. But I do want to say as a physician, who, who was, you know, trained in the 90s um, and subject to not having that, you know, level of education and nutrition. This is a fantastic conversation, but as a physician, I do want to say that your, your answer to the question about the immune system and where you first went to the place where the immune system basically lives in your gut um, and having an unhealthy gut or unhealthy gut biome or bacteria makes a huge difference. I love that. That was great. And I think everybody, and I, I don't think people pay attention to that enough in thinking about um, how they live their lives and how their and how their much their gut health uh, affects everything other every other part of your body but it's a system and it all interplays and we have to pay attention uh, to every piece of it I think you did a great that was a great wrap up on lifestyle nutrition exercise it's very clear that that this is an incredibly complicated topic um, and there's no 40 minute show that's going to give you all the answers uh, as we have been saying throughout the show you should always consult with uh, an expert in clinical nutrition and changing your diet uh, severely or radically um, can have adverse health effects but also can have a lot of benefits and but getting that benefit can sometimes be complicated and isn't necessarily good fodder for what you read on google or um, or some marketing piece that was sent to you in the email. Um, so I will, I'm going to end with a quick story and then I want to have a wrap up. Um, it's about dogs. So I have a buddy who has one, it'll take one minute. I have a buddy who has three dogs. And uh, we, one time my wife and I went to his house and I looked at the dogs and I said, I said, John, these dogs are incredibly healthy. They look beautiful. They're thin, their coats are shiny. And 
He and it was around the time where my dog, who was who was eight, or almost eight years old at the time, I have a puggle, uh, was getting fat and was slothy, and I could recognize how lazy he was, and he was starting to have a difficult time jumping on the couch. And John told me that he he got rid of like a year before that he had gotten rid of all of the processed dog food and was making his own dog food out of natural ingredients: chicken, uh, beef, uh, carrots, spinach, you name it. He puts it in there. Um, so I started doing that, and at the same time, my dog had been diagnosed with an ACL tear. We were it was proposed to us that we have that he has surgery and would need like eight to ten weeks of rehab. So I started making his food from I make. I do chicken, beef, um, spinach, rice, potatoes, carrots, um, and sometimes I throw in like a beef liver or some marrow bones or something along that. Good for a dog. No salt, no pepper, no spices, nothing. Uh, if you if you ever need to quarantine and you can't get to the supermarket, um, you can always eat Henry's dog food. Uh, so so within three months, he was a puppy again, spinning around, jumping on the couch, no AC, no more ACL pain. It was the most amazing thing I ever saw, and that's how biological organisms respond to good nutrition. I did an experiment with my dog. Please do the same experiment with yourselves. Carl, do you have anything else to wrap up with? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think you know our bodies are extremely powerful in their ability to heal, but you need to be fueling them with good quality nutrition from whole foods, you know, if you take away one thing from this conversation, I think, you know, just trying to reduce the amount of processed foods and, you know, promote more whole foods in your diet can have such an immense impact on your health. Um, not just from an aesthetic perspective, but just how you feel and, you know, live your life each and every day. So what a great and complex topic. We're definitely going to have Carlin back. Carlin, thank you so much for joining us today. You've been listening to and watching. Thank you. You've been watching Women's Health Weekly, coming to you live from New York City and the women's health experts at Maiden Lane Medical. Please subscribe to our channel. Please check out our podcast when it comes out early next week and catch us next week on Friday at noon live with Dr. Stephanie Blank, who's an expert in gynecologic oncology. We'll be talking about pap smears and HPV and everything associated with cervical health. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend.